Ann Byler and her husband bought a food stand at an Amish market. There was just one problem. The pretzels tasted lousy. So Ann decided to tweak the recipe, and Auntie Ann's was born. Ann Byler, creator of the famous Auntie Ann's pretzel franchise, is known for her success. Yet what many don't know is the devastation she endured before it when her 19-month-old daughter, Angie, was killed. My sister was driving a bobcat and uh, hauling sand. And as she was doing that, she didn't see Angie that morning. And uh, when she turned the bobcat to go forward, she saw Angie in front of the bobcat. Uh, she was killed instantly that morning. In her book, The Secret Lies Within, Anne recounts her story of loss, the years of sexual abuse she endured at the hands of her pastor, and how the power of confession saved her life. Ann Byler is here with us now, and we welcome you back to the 700 Club. It's great to see you again. Thank you, Terry. It's my honor to be here with you. Go back to the very beginning with us, if you will. How did you know how to make pretzels? Oh, I never knew how to make pretzels until I was 40. <laughs> so, so where did that... It was at a farmer's market in uh, Downingtown, Pennsylvania. And I went to work to basically support my husband, who was passionate about... Uh, doing counseling for marriages and uh, he was doing it as a free service and obviously no money to bank. undergird it yeah <laughs> and so I went to work basically to uh, just to uh, make a living so pretzels seemed like a good idea <laughs> <laughs> well the, the the market stand that we bought had uh, oh, so were selling pretzels you were sort of carrying on yes, the... so it carried all what we bought and that's how it happened. you never really advertised and yet this just took off like wildfire. How did that happen? Well, it happened because I knew what we had was a great product, and I didn't let anyone walk past our store uh, without giving them a sample of our uh, anti-against pretzels. Yeah. And that was really our form of uh, advertising for many, many, many years. I, just I love taste the, it, and you'll love it. The pretzel sticks in the yeah. bag with the, <laughs> yeah, wonderful. <laughs> well, you and your husband both came out of uh, an Amish Mennonite background. And one of the things that is an aspect of that faith group is not sharing emotions, not letting emotions be freely shown. How did that impact you? Well, you know, mom and dad, there are eight of us kids, and they were loving parents, took us to church every Sunday. We sat around the dinner table, breakfast, lunch, and dinner back in the day. So our family life was very secure, and it was very, uh, I felt very happy as a kid. One line that my mom always said to us throughout the years was, little children love each other. Do not give each other pain. When one speaks to you in anger, do not answer them again. So Just even though it's a it. sweet little uh, line that she would say to us, I never realized until many, many years later, yeah. uh, what do you do when you can't talk? Yeah. You stuff. And that really became my way of life. So a few years after you and your husband were married, and you mentioned it or we mentioned it a bit in that initial video, a tragedy struck. I mean, a tragedy that destroys some people. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. The other thing that really was kind of a setup for me was that I believed that life is good mm -hmm. and that God is harsh. And I believed that if I was a good girl, that God would bless me, he'd be pleased with me, and I would just forever be, I don't know, I guess I thought I was immune. Unscathed, mm -hmm. maybe, somewhat, by, you know? yes. yes. Uh -huh. But uh, years later now, I understand the truth is life is hard, God is good. Yeah. I don't confuse the two anymore. Mm -hmm. So I really wasn't prepared for a tragedy. And when our sweet little Angela Joy, 19 months and 12 days, when she was killed instantly on our little farm, um, she, as she made her ascent into heaven, I began my gradual descent into a world of uh, spiritual confusion and emotional pain, because I thought, I didn't understand. I was, I was a good girl. I didn't. Why I did thought I was to pleasing me? to God and that he would bless me. And I just didn't understand. But I, I understand today, life is hard and he's good. So how did you, here, here you are kind of trapped in this, this way that you've grown up, feeling like you can't share your feelings or be open about your emotions. I mean, to lose a child like that is a devastating scenario. How did you walk through that without being able to share those things? Well, initially, we had lots of support in the Amish and Mennonite community. There's lots of support uh, initially when someone uh, finds themselves in this kind of a tragic uh, place. Mm -hmm. So 
initially I felt great support, but to be able to then, as time went on, to to feel the grief and the sadness and the loneliness, and the, at one point I really felt terribly defeated because I wasn't living an overcoming life. Mm -hmm. I wasn't more than a conqueror. And so Satan was always whispering to me, you know, if you really were a very good Christian, you know, you, you would be overcoming, you'd get over this. And so nobody really said we can't talk about it, but you know, honestly, Terry, I didn't have the vocabulary mm -hmm. to describe the grief that I was feeling. And my husband and I just drifted apart, stayed together, but drifted Well, apart. many marriages don't survive that. So you went to your pastor to get some counsel to help you work through all the things that you were feeling at that time, and what happened? Five months after Angie was killed, uh, he came to me and said, just come see me at the office and you know, we'll talk about this. And I was overjoyed. Um, when I finally went to talk to him, I felt this uh, relief, like, wow, I, I do know how to talk about how I'm feeling if somebody helps me or listens to me. Mm -hmm. And so I was feeling relief that day. And um, when I, before I left his office, he took advantage of me. And uh, I knew nothing about sexual abuse. I knew nothing about abuse of spiritual what did power. You think? Well, I, I felt like it was my fault. Like, what did I do wrong? And uh, leaving his office, I decided that day that I would never tell anyone uh, what, what he did because I knew they wouldn't believe me because he was a beloved pastor in our church. We had a very exciting, charismatic church. And it, it, I, I had, it, it took my voice yeah. away. I, could, I didn't have the right to speak, which many times in abuse, we do feel like we're trapped. We don't have our, our voices stolen from us. And Most of the time. Yes, yeah. yes. So this went on for a, a window of time. What made you finally say, this has to stop? Well, after about seven years, um, I was skin and bones. I was from falling apart from the inside out. You know, I love the line that Dr. Richard Dobbins says, alone we die, connected we live. And I was alone and I was dying. And we had two daughters at that time. And during that time, I prayed every, every day by my bedside, asking Jesus to help me, to forgive me, and cried out to him all the time. And the good news, Terry, is that he always heard me. Yeah. And he always listens to us in our despair. And yeah. every time we come to him, he's there listening. And I knew that. And, uh, but the three things that I learned during that experience was the three types of confession. It was the bedside prayer mm. and it's the, uh, journaling, which we all love David. He wrote how many Psalms yeah. journaling, talking about how we feel. So I was able to do that. And, um, but the one to another confession is really what, um, put me into the light and what really set me free, James 5, 16. There's something about that, especially where there's something where the enemy comes in and puts shame in your heart or in your mind. There's something about speaking it mm -hmm. that makes that flee. Mm -hmm. You know, the power of a secret can destroy yeah. us, but the power of confession will give us life. Yeah. And after all those years, it's like God said to me, get up off your knees and go tell your husband what's going on in your life. <laughs> well, I, w I would rather stay on my knees yeah. <laughs> or keep journaling. I did not want to tell my husband. Yeah. Next option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I did, and as I went to, uh, to confess to my husband, I was in my little blue Toyota pickup truck, and all the way to his body shop, my palms were sweating, my heart was racing, and I just kept crying. I said, Lord, I can't, I can't tell him. I don't want to put this on him. Yeah. But I did, and it takes a lot of, it took courage for me, and it will take courage for anyone to uncover secrets that just really keep you bound. But that day, as I told Jonas uh, what was going on in my life, it was a very short confession, but it was the beginning of a new life. It was the beginning of redemption for us. The one confession that I made to him that day changed the trajectory of my entire life, mm -hmm. and it began the journey of redemption. It's when Jesus began redeeming me from all of my past, all of my darkness, all of my pain, my blame, and my shame. My guilt was more than I could bear. But in that one little two-line confession that I made, my husband looked at me, and the look was all I could take. So all I did was say what I had to say and turned around and walked away. Mm. And that night uh, when he came back, he said, "Hun, we need to talk about 
what you talked to me about today. And I said, I don't want to talk about it. I, I just didn't know how I was going to be able to talk about it. He said, well, I know that you're not happy, and I've known it for many years, but I thought it was because of Angie's death. I want you to be happy, and so don't leave me in the middle of the night. And during all this time, I really believed the lies. Satan tells us so many lies in our pain and in our darkness and in, in this place of secrets. We believe the lies. And I believed that, truly believed that he would divorce me. And so we began to talk, and he just said, Hun, I know that you want to... I know that you've been unhappy, and if you'll just tell me that you need to go find someplace, live somewhere else, let me know, and I'll help you. I'll help you pack your bags, and we'll, f we'll do this together. Wow. But if you go, you have to take the girls with you mm. because they need their mother. You can't even imagine what that meant to me because I felt unforgivable, unlovable, unchangeable, unworthy of anything good in my life. I felt like a horrible mom, a bad wife. And my husband is telling me, my girls need their mother. Mm -hmm. It was the beginning of the spark of hope in me that changed everything for me in that moment. But it started with the power of confession. You know, Anne said a moment ago that secrets can destroy us. And The Secret Lies Within is the name of her book. And it is an amazing book. If you are struggling with something in your life, some shame, some uh, self-loathing, some need for healing, this is a wonderful beginning for you. Get the book and read it. It's available nationwide. Thank you for being so vulnerable. It's my great pleasure, Terry. Thank, Thank you. you.